This is the last lecture this semester, and in this lecture, we'll talk about the cash flow and risk estimation in capital budgeting. In the previous lecture, we studied capital budgeting techniques with given cash flow estimates. For example, with a set of cash flows given, we calculated the MPV and IRR and payback of the project and try to decide whether the project is acceptable. Now, in this lecture, we will study how to estimate cash flows and also the risks involved in those cash flows. To estimate cash flows, we need to identify the so-called relevant or inc incremental cash flows. And um, we also need to identify the long-term capital expenditure and short-term working capital investments. Um, other issues include the depreciation expense and uh, salvage value. We will discuss useful risk analysis tools such as the sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis, and also simulation analysis. To explain the concept better, in this lecture we'll use the mini case at the end of chapter 11 in the Brinkham and Accurate textbook. So I would uh, suggest you read the mini case for details about the project. Uh, below is a summary about the information given about this project. So expenditure on the equipment is $200,000, which is the cost to purchase the equipment. And then there is $10,000 shipping cost and uh, $30,000 expense for installation. The economic life for the equipment is four years. So we are looking at a four-year project. At the end of the fourth year, when you wrap up the project, and sell the equipment, you can receive a $25,000 salvage value for the equipment. The equipment falls in the MACRS three-year class for depreciation. We'll explain that later. With the project, each year we can sell 1,250 units of the product. And sell price per unit is $200, and the cost per unit is $100. So this is a variable cost of $100 per unit. And net operating working capital investment is 12% of the sales each every year. Tax rate is 40%. The cost of capital back is 10% for this project. Now, first, we'll discuss the concept of incremental cash flows. A project's incremental cash flow is the cash flow for the whole company with the project minus the cash flow for the whole company without the project. So the difference between with the project and without the project is the incremental cash flow brought by this project. So understanding this principle helps us to identify the following issues that include the sunk cost, the opportunity cost, and externalities. Speaking of the sunk cost, suppose $100,000 had been spent last year to improve the production line site. Should this cost be included in the analysis? We say no because this is a sunk cost. A sunk cost is a past cost that has already been incurred and cannot be recovered no matter whether this project will be taken or not. Therefore, it is not an incremental cost for the company. Remember, being incremental means there would be a difference if you take the project versus not taking the project. But in this case, no matter whether you take this project or not, this sunk cost already occurred, so cannot be recovered, then it doesn't make a difference if you take the project. So this is not an incremental cost for the company. And again, we should focus on the incremental investment and operating cash flows. Now let's think about opportunity cost. Suppose the plant space could be leased out for $25,000 a year. Would this affect the analysis? We say yes, because accepting the project means we will not receive the $25,000. This is the opportunity cost and it should be charged to the project. Opportunity cost is defined as a cost of an alternative that must be foregone in order to pursue a certain action. In other words, the benefits you could have received by taking an alternative action but now have to give up. In this example, after tax, the opportunity cost from this potential income is $25,000 multiplied by 1 minus T, T being the 40% tax rate. So there is a $15,000 annual cost as the opportunity cost. Now, about externalities. 
If the new product line would decrease sales of the firm's other product by $50,000 per year, would this affect the analysis? We say yes. The effects on the other project's cash flows in the same company are the so-called externalities. Net cash flow loss per year on other lines could be a cause because of this project. And of course, externalities may not always be negative. They can be positive if new projects are complements to existing assets or products, and uh, they can be negative if new projects are substitute to existing assets or products. So, put in other words, if this project can boost the sales of other projects, then we have positive externalities. But if pr this project or this pr product actually can hurt the cash flows from other projects within the same company, then we have negative externalities. Let's also think about the financing cost. Should you subtract the interest expense or dividend when calculate the operating cash flows from this project? We say no. The interest expense and dividend payments, they are part of the cost of capital. So if we subtract them from cash flows, we would be double counting the capital cost. We discount project cash flows with a cost of capital that is the rate of return required by all investors. Remember, that's the concept of VAC. And uh, so we should discount the total amount of cash flows available to all investors and uh, avoid double counting the capital cost. Again, at this point, we are not supposed to subtract the interest expense or dividend payments when we calculate the operating cash flows. Let's keep this in mind later when we estimate the cash flows. To estimate the project cash flows, let's start from year zero. How much is the total investment on the equipment at year zero? Investment on the equipment, also called the capital expenditure, include the cost to purchase the equipment and also the shipping and installation expenses. As you see from the calculation here, we have a total $240,000 investment. Since the equipment is a long-term investment, this $240,000 can be recovered later through depreciation. Therefore, we will use this whole amount, $240,000, as a depreciation basis to calculate depreciation expenses in the later years. So a common mistake would be only including $200,000 as a depreciation basis. But here, as you see, we actually can include or two forty hundred thousand dollars and uh, calculate depreciation expenses based on the total two forty thousand dollars. Now let's start a timeline and put this two forty thousand dollars on the timeline. So since we have a four year project, as you see on the timeline, I start from year zero and I have year one, two, three, and four. In my year zero, I have a negative two forty hundred thousand dollars as the capital expenditure at the beginning of this project. Now let's think about depreciation. We follow the modified accelerated cost recovery system to calculate the depreciation expense each every year. An explanation of the MACRS system and the recovery allowance percentage can be found in the appendix 11A, which is in page 481 to page 483. Of course, you are not required to memorize the percentage number under each category. Uh, you just have to understand how this MACRS system works. Under the MACRS system, assets are divided into classes by type of asset or by business in which the asset is used. A taxpayer must compute tax deductions for depreciation of tangible property using specified lives and months. The IRS publishes detailed tables of lives by classes of assets. Faster acceleration allows taxpayer to deduct greater amount of depreciation during the first few years of an asset's life. This would result in lower earning before tax and therefore lower tax and lower net income in the first few years. But lower tax paid means higher cash flows in the first few years. While well, the total amount of accumulated depreciation, total net income, and total cash flow over years, in this case, over all four years, may not be affected because if you think about the whole four years, the total amount of accumulated depreciation or net income or total cash flows over all these four years 
um, would be the same no matter whether you do the accelerated depreciation or not. But having more cash flows in the first couple of years can increase the value of project. This is, of course, the idea of time, value, or money. If you have more money at the beginning, that's always better. This is part of the depreciation table where we use the percentage numbers from a MACRS three-year system. So as you see, first year, you're allowed to deduct 33% of the total asset value. And second year, you're allowed to depreciate 45%. And all these four years together, you have 100% of the asset depreciated. And uh, apparently, as you see, the majority of the asset value had depreciated over the first two years. So that's the idea of accelerated depreciation. We use these percentage numbers to multiply by the initial depreciation basis of $240,000. Remember, this $240,000 include the purchase price, the shipping cost, and the installation cost. So first year, 33% multiplied by $240,000. We have $79.2,000. That is the depreciation expense for the first year. And the second year, 45% multiplied by $240,000. We have $108,000. That will be the depreciation expense for the second year, and third year, and fourth year. And uh, these four numbers all together, they should account for the total $240,000. In other words, the $240,000 will be depreciated over the next four years. And the depreciation expenses calculated here will be used later to estimate the operating cash flows. And these percentage numbers are based on the IRS specification, so you can go to table 11A-2 in page 483 to check out these numbers. So this is under the MACRS three-year system. According to IRS specification, this kind of equipment is supposed to be depreciated under the MACRS three-year system. Now we can actually estimate the operating cash flows each every year for the next four years. As you see, each every year from this project, we can sell about 1250 units of the products. And for the first year, the unit price is 200 per unit. So the total amount of sales is 200 multiplied by 1250. That's how we get $250,000. Unit cost is 100 per unit. So for 1250 units, the total cost is $125,000. And if we estimate a 3% inflation, then one year later, the price of the product will be 206 per unit, which is 3% more than 200 and the cost will also increase by 3%, so that 103 is 3% over the $100 from the first year. And uh, 206 multiplied by 1250, we get the total amount of sales for the second year, $257,500. And the cost is 103 multiplied by 1250, and we get $128,750. And you can do this for year three and year four. Just remember, with a 3% inflation, then each every year the price increased by 3%. Um, we use the unit price multiplied by the total number of units to get the total amount of sales revenue. And we use the unit cost multiplied by the units to get the total cost. Once we get the total sales revenue and uh, total co operating cost, we subtract the cost from sales. We can get the gross profit. And then each every year, when we subtract the depreciation expense from here, then we get the EBIT, which is earning before interest and tax. So this structure, as you see, this is like from lecture two when we study the basic income statement, right? Now, once you have the EBIT, we subtract 40% at tax. We get the NOPA, which is net operating profit after tax. As you see here, we do not deduct interest expense at this stage. Okay, again, interest expense is part of the financing cost. So while well, we estimate the operating cash flows, we avoid double counting the financing cost. So we are not deducting the interest expenses here. Um, once we subtract the tax from the EBIT, we get the NOPAT. 
And uh, then we add the depreciation back because depreciation is a non-cash expense that was already deducted to calculate the earnings. Now we want to add them back to estimate the net operating cash flows. So when you add 79200 back to the notepad, we get the net operating cash flow of 106680. And uh, we do this for year two and year three and year four. So this will remind you if you actually set up an Excel template, you do not have to calculate year one and two and three and four separately. You just have to do it for year one and then copy and paste the formula that applies to year two and three and four, then you can get the result pretty fast. Now, let's go back to the timeline that we drew before. Remember year zero, we had a $240,000 initial investment, or say capital expenditure. And then year one, two, three, four, these numbers are the operating cash flows each every year that we just got from last slides. Now, the question is, what else do we have to consider?